so every week to to make things maybe not too homogeneous i thought it would be nice to give you a practical tip of the week every day every, every week that is unrelated to the lecture but still useful in the channel yeah it's just a general useful thing to know when you do scripting programming so the first the first tip of the week is a um, concept that you have in git and it's the it's the git ignore file and it's a specific file that you can add to your repository so it's just called dot git ignore you can just create that file and add it to your repository and what it allows you to do is to ignore certain files in your in your github repository so think about the case where you let's say you want to write you have a github repository for your master thesis and you write your master thesis in tech in latex and so essentially you have thesis.tech and maybe a bash script that compile.sh that compiles that script and so you you add both these these files to a repository and now you compile your your master thesis and suddenly you have have about 20 other files in that in that directory it's there's going to be locked files and pdf files and i don't know all kind of biptech files and when you do when you handle git now all these files will suddenly show up and say warnings you know if you have untracked files you might lose that work but you know that they're useless they're just temporary files anyway so you want to tell git to just ignore them and that's exactly what this um git ignore what this git ignore file does so here's here's an example when i when i type in git status and i don't have a git ignore file i get all these untracked file messages saying that or dot pyc this is python temporary compiled files that um, are untracked right and this might be many many hundreds of files so it's just wasting uh, like cluttering my terminal and then then what you do is you, you create a got git ignore file in your repository and you just in that file it's a text file you just list the files that you want to have ignored so this might be the content of the file so here i'm saying please ignore star is a placeholder so everything that ends with dot pyc <coughs> then i want to have everything ignored that's inside the dot cache directory i want to have all the dot swp these are swap files ignored and so on and so forth so you you just add all these everything that you don't want, don't want to have tracked and once you've done that and you call git status again you'll see that um Git doesn't show up these warning or these messages anymore. And of course, it's quite useful to also commit your dot ignore file into the repository itself. Right? So just add it to your repository and commit it so that if someone else downloads it, they have the same dot ignore file. And so one tip is that if for many common programming languages, you can actually download default git ignore files that kind of um yeah that have the most common temporary files listed in already so you just download if you know that your python program you just go to that repository here download the relevant git ignore file and just just add it to your to your repository as well and then you you're good to go okay that was the first tip of the week now let's go back to bash oh dear okay He stopped. Oops. So the last thing I explained was this idea of the inputs and the outputs of processes. And now I'm going to show you how you can use that to combine bash scripts. And the way you do that, the, what you need for that is called a pipe. So it's the literally it's a pipe that connects the inputs or outputs of the um, 
um, of the programs. And so the syntax for that is just a vertical, this vertical line. And it connects the standard output of one command to the st standard input of another command. So here are some examples. The first one here, I list the I list the files in my current directory in a long format, and then I pass that output into the crep command. The crep command is a filter, and it simply filters lines that that contain the word three 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 one. So this combined this command together lists all my files, all the files and directories in my current directory. Uh, all the files and directories that contain the name 3331. That's what it does. It lists a subset of my files that contain this name here. The second example. Actually, it will also list any files that have, uh, for example, 43,331 bytes. Right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, yeah. So, so then the next line again lists the files in my current directory. And this time I pass the output into a command called less. And that simply paginates. It's, a, it's kind of a out text output viewer that allows me to scroll down and up uh, in long outputs. So imagine the point here is, I mean, maybe this is more useful if you have, if the, here on the left you have a compilation output that that spans many, many, many pages, and you want to be able to quickly kind of scroll through it, right? then you can pass that output into the less command, and then you can use your up and down arrow keys to scroll through the, through the output. So the next example here, here I'm, I'm interested in a bash command called history. And I want to learn more about it, so essentially all what I do is I, I call up the manual page of bash and I use the crep command. Remember crep filters lines for, that contain a certain uh, key. And so I crep that manual page for the name history. And essentially what I get is I get all the lines in the manual page of bash that contain the name history. And so here the example of the last one is that you can, you can actually repeat that process. And so here, I get my, this is, this prints out the processes um, on, on the system. Here I filter out the processes that are owned by myself. So this is my username here. So I'm on, only interested in the process of my username. And then I count the number of lines that I get. So essentially this command together shows me how many processes am I running on my, on my computer. So do you see that, I mean, all of these kind of have one specific tool, but by combining them, I get exactly the information that I'm interested in. Here's another example. Let's say I'm interested in sorting all the, um, I'm interested, so I have this lectures directory that contains all my lectures. And the problem is that it uses a lot of disk space. So some of the files in there are, are really, really big and I would like to delete them. So essentially what I want is I want to have all the files listed in that subdirectory ordered by their size, with the biggest file first so I can kind of look through them. So what I do is this first command on the left, disk usage, du, is just disk usage minus a lectures. So this prints me all the files and uh, files and subdirectories in this lecture directory, unordered, right? So it's always the file size and then the file name, file size, file name, in an unordered list. Then I pass that into the sort command. And what that will do is it will resort that output by um, um, yeah, reverse numerical. So now I will have the biggest files first with the, with the smallest files on the bottom. And then I pass that into the less command so that I can scroll up and down. Yeah. So this is, it's quite useful to actually sit down and just try this out yourself. So just, just execute the first left command, see what you get. Then 
execute these two commands, see what you get, and then finally try out the full command to see what you get. So here's another example. Let's say you have an output. Maybe you have a program that, uh, a compilation program that produces a lot of output and you want to store that output to disk so that you can inspect it later. But at the same time, you want to look at it um, on the screen. The way you do that is you use the T command. So it's, the T is like a, uh, you know, visually this is like a T here. So what it does, it, it, um, the T writes something to file and at the same, same time spits it out to uh, the command line again, right? So it doubles the output in a way. So here I have my compile step and then I pass that to the T command, which then stores the output in compile.log and at the same time writes it to, still to, to the standard output. And then of course you could pass it again Beyond this to less if you want to scroll up and down. Another way, so these pipes are used to pass information from the standard out to a new program. Another way, another thing that you can do is to save the standard output into a file. And this is called redirects. And the syntax is simply this, uh, uh, is it a larger symbol? So if, you, if I have my script.sh and I want to store its output into my file.txt, that's what it does. It, it redirects all the standard output into that file. You can, always, you, you can also use a double greater sign to, by default, this my file will be emptied and the output of my script will be, fill, uh, will be filled in. If you just want to append the output to an existing file, you use the dub double greater sign here. And the same thing here works with the standard input. So if you want to use a file as an, as an input to a program, use the smaller sign. So remember double, 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 WC, the WC program counts the number of words here. And if you just run it, then you have to enter the text manually, but here, I just use an existing file to pass it in as a standard in. So what this command will do here, in total, it will tell you the number of words that the file myfile.txt contains. So by default, when you use these redirects with larger and smaller, uh, with the larger, it will redirect the standard output. And so if you, if you just write larger file name, and um, then all the standard output will appear in the file name, but if there's an error message, that will still appear on the console. But you can actually specify which stream you want to redirect to file by using the syntax up here. So you say the name of the stream and then larger symbol. And so essentially, if you use one, then it's standard in. If you use two, then it's standard error. And if it's an end, then you redirect both. So yeah, the examples down here visualize that. So if you want to delete, this just deletes all files, all text files. And then if you want to lock that, you can um, redirect the standard output. If you want to redirect the errors, right, then you use this syntax up here. And if you want to keep track of both the standard, the errors, and the normal output, use the end larger sign. So this strategy can also be used to, um, to print error messages in your script. And what you do is, essentially, you redirect the, so you know echo, the echo program, it prints out stuff to the standard output stream, and it normally just appears on your, on your screen. But the trick is now, if you use echo, and then we redirect the standard output to the standard error, right, then the result of that command will print a message into the standard error stream. And this redirection from standard output to standard error is, is visualized here. 
So you take, so the normal Lasha sign here, I, here you could have, I could have added a one to specify I want to redirect the standard output, but I can leave it out because that's the default. And then here on the right hand side, this is where I want to redirect it to. So normally there's a file here, but in this case, I just use the end and then the stream name. So end two means I want to redirect it into the standard error, error stream. Okay, does that make any sense? Kind of, yeah. So essentially what I want to say is, if you want to write error messages in your script, then use this line, then use this syntax here. And then that's kind of, from a streaming perspective, that's the correct thing to do. And so of course, you can combine now these redirects and, this, and these pipes. So let's say you have a compilation step and um, you want to be, you want to keep track of both the normal compilation outputs and potential errors. So then what I do is I run compile, I redirect the standard, the standard error, so two, I redirect that into the standard output. So now everything of that command will just come out of the standard output. Then I pass that through the T command so that I, I keep a log file. And then finally I, I also pass that through the less pagination command so that I can nicely um, scroll through it on screen. So it's a little quiz. I have a script here that um, can potentially be simplified. Do you have any idea what, how one could achieve that? So I should probably note that these double equal, double ends, this just means first execute the command to the left, and if it's successful, then command, uh, execute the command to the right. So essentially it's just first this command and afterwards this command on the right. Should probably be the same file name if you want to simplify it. Right, yes. Good point. So let's yeah. Yeah. Should we use pipeline? Yes, exactly. So think of what I'm doing here. So I, I run the command ls, I store its output in a text file, and then I call the crap command, and as input, I take the, the content of the same file again. So in other words, what I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm running L, the ls command, and I'm passing its output simply to the grab command. So up here, I've done the same thing. It's just I've first stored the output to file, and then I read it out again and used as an input. And and if you want it on the file, you need to have an e, e5 before the rest. Right. If, if you want to have the file. Yeah, for later. right, in the second example. Fair enough. And out, out uh, pipe to T, pipe to text, pipe to rest. Fair enough. The point was here that you can actually avoid using files altogether yeah. by using pipes. But uh, yeah, so the, um, if you wanted to keep, in the second case here, if you wanted to also have this files.txt file, then you could use t. Yeah. Let's look at a more, let's look at a practical example. And let's start to see how we can improve it. So I have this simulation package called Pulse. And it takes in, I normally run it with some command line arguments. So I use this minus CMT. This can specify the, um, the project that I'm running. So here it's called Winslow Wise project. Then I have a case name command and argument. Here I can specify which case I want to run. And then this, so there's these arguments that I need to provide, but then there's also some input or the standard input that I need to pass in. And these are some configuration, it's a config, configuration file that I need to, that I need to write first. In this case, it's just called ellipsoid.i, right? And so then, because I'm also in, I'm interested in, I want to keep, tr I want to have a log file of the um, of my simulation output, so I pass the output through the t command so that I can both store to file and see it on the screen. 
So I've coded this up and this works fine, but there's some problems with that. And the problem is that it's not very flexible, right? So everything is hard coded here. So for instance, sometimes it would be useful to change the command line arguments, the command line options here that are hard coded. And it might be useful to change also the input and the output files. So specifically, if I run my simulation multiple times, then every time I keep writing into the same output file, so I lose the outputs of my previous simulations. And so also for the input file, so, so every time I, when I want to run a new simulations, I have to open up an editor, change the input files, and run it again. So it would be uh, much nicer to be able to control this also through the command line interface. So to start with, the first thing that we can do is that we, that we extend our script so that it takes command line arguments instead of just hard coding, uh, hard coding the cases. So what I do is I just parameterize all the inputs of my, script, of my line here. So instead of hard coding the name here, I now use variable names, the case, the in file, and the out file. And these, are, these variables are defined up here. And then, you know, in many cases, it's actually fine to use hard-coded variables for most of the settings. And maybe I'm just interested in changing my project name in many cases. So what I do is I have a, a default project name here. And then I have an if statement where I check if the number of command line arguments is larger than one. Right, so remember this dollar hash is the number of command line arguments. Then if that's true, then I just set my project name equal to the dollar to the first command line argument. And then this one's. Right, so this is great. So now I can, when I run the script, I can provide the project name and vary that. So now if I want to have not only change this project name, but also the case file and the in file and out file, you need to do some more advanced command line parsing, and I'll show that to you in a second how we can do that. Let's move on to the second problem. The second problem was that we keep overwriting the, the same output file when I run simulations multiple times. So how can we solve that? A simple solution is to use a new output file name every time we run the command. And the simple idea is to give that out, to make that output file name unique. So the one way you can do that is we create a new directory for the output file and that directory contains the current date and time stamp, right? So essentially, um, and, and then in that directory you store the output file. So essentially then after I run it multiple times, I get many timestamps and then if I, directories with the names, with the timestamp as a name, and I can go into that and look at the output. So the way I do that is I create a new directory, uh, a new variable called the chop dir, my chop directory, and this dollar pwd is a, is a variable, avail, a variable in bash that contains the current directory. And so here, remember here I execute the date command and I, I, use the out, and I use the output here as a variable name. The next line creates a new directory of that chop there, and then I go into that directory using the cd command. And then I execute my script just as before, and then I go outside my chop directory again, and here at the end, these last three lines what I, what I do is I want to make, I want to create a new link that always points, the link is a link to a directory with the name latest. And if I, that link should always point to the latest uh, job that I found. So what I do is I have an if statement where I check if that latest link already exists. And if it does, then I just remove it. And then the last line here creates a link for my job directory. Uh, a link called latest that points into the job directory. 
Okay, so that's that's definitely a solution that would work. There are some alternatives that you could use. For instance, instead of using the date as a unique name, you could use the process ID. So every uh, every process on Unix has a specific ID that you can ask for. Also, the script has a specific ID, so you could you could use that um, for the for the output file. The problem is when you, for instance, restart your computer, these IDs are, might potentially be reused. So this is not really re unique. But it's uh, useful for temporary files, for it's, example. Yeah, exactly. So for temporary files, I mean, I'm not saying that this can't be used for any cases, but it's not absolutely safe. There's also a command called make temp that is specifically has the purpose of creating temporary directories with a unique name. So we could just use make temp. Or, you know, if you want to be absolutely certain, we can actually check. We can come up with a name, for instance, with the ID approach. And then we can check. We have an if statement where we check if that output directory exists, just to be sure that we don't overwrite existing outputs. So the way you do that is you have this if statement, and then for the condition, you use minus D and then the directory of the name. So minus D checks for the existence of a directory. And if that evaluates true, right, then I uh, print out a warning message and exit the program. And otherwise, I'm, I'm sure that this directory does not exist yet, and so I can continue. As always, there's various different ways on how you can write if statements in bash just for you to be aware of it um, when you read other people's fi uh, bash scripts so there's essentially here three different ways on how you can write the same uh, if statement i've shown you at the beginning of the lecture i've shown you the first version and so if if you like that one the most you can just stick to that one but um, you can also use the ones on the bottom So the next problem was of our shell script was that we had this input file. And the input file, if I wanted to change something in there, I would have to open it and edit it every single time. Right? And so we can use the bash script to convert that into input file into command line arguments. That's the idea. And the way this works is what we will do is we take the command line arguments, then we will create an configuration file on the fly and use that as an input file to the script and to, to the application. So how do we write files in bash? Well, it's easy. You use the, the cat command, um, use the cat command, so cat prints out a string to, um, uh, sorry, cat um, prints out the content of a file. And so what I'm doing here is I copy the content of this string here into the file with the file name my file. And these, this is a separator here. This is a multi-line uh, string. And this is a unique um, indicator here. So this is end of file. And essentially, the file is, by definition, ends when there's a line starting with that indicator here. So it's essentially you have these four lines, or five lines, and then this, this keyword here indicates that the file is over. So when you execute this command here, you will end up with a file, with a new file in your system called my file that contains these five lines. And also this um, variable here is substituted. So the line, the text doesn't have to be EUF. It is whatever no. you write after there right. that ends the text. Yeah. So you might want to choose, maybe you have the keyword EOF inside the text, then you can actually change that keyword here and you can use your, your unique a unique keyword here. And of course, then you also have to have the keyword on you. Okay, so that's how you write files. 
the next thing that we need to do is we need to generalize our command line handling. Right? So remember, that was quite simple. So the way we do that is, um, right, here's one solution. So what I do is I loop over all my command line. I loop, I have a while loop that loops un, un, as long as I have more than one command line left. This is this dollar hash sign. And then what I do is, inside the while loop, is I extract the first command line. And then I, so remember the command line was always minus CMT space and then the project name, minus case name and then the case uh, study. So what I do is I first extract the first part, so there are always tuples. There's minus CMT and minus project name and then the value. So what I do is I first, these two lines extract the first part of the tuple and then I check which options I'm using. So I use this case command, which essentially is an if statement with the different options. So in case this option variable is minus M, then I set the M variable equals to the next command line argument and I remove, remove that one again with shift. And if it's B, then I set the B variable to be that command line argument and I remove it again. And for all other cases, I print out an error message saying, you know, I only support minus M and minus B as command line arguments. The rest is invalid. And that's it. That's how you can handle multiple. Um, that's how you can com uh, handle multiple command line arguments nicely. You probably would want to exit one. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it's an error. Fine. Yeah, I'll show that in a second. So of course, what I've shown you just now with this, with this case, you could also have done with if statements, right? It's the same thing. So you could also check if the option is equal to minus M, then do the following and so on and so forth. So now, now we've read in the command line arguments. And so now that means we can dynamically generate the configuration file. So the way we do that is we use this um, strategy of writing files and here, this is my in file, is the temporary configuration file that I want to write into. And then the contents are simply maybe some fixed, you know, maybe some fixed variables that I'm not changing through the command and arguments, plus the parameters that I've received through the command line arguments. And then after that, I can run my pulse application with this temporary configuration file as a standard input. So one thing that's quite useful is that you can um, check if pulse application was successful or not. And the way you do that, remember there was this return code that every process has. And it is zero if the process was successful and non-zero otherwise. And you can access that variable, you can access that value with a dollar question mark variable. So essentially, after I run the pulse app, what I can do is I can have this if statement where I say, is this variable not equal to zero? Then I print out an error message and I exit, and here I can actually provide an error in exit code, return code as well. So here I specifically exit with a non-zero return code. Right, so there's four loops. So what happens now if you want to run your application with multiple inputs? One, and you want to go kind of through each input one by one. So you can either specify these multiple files in the command line, but you can also use this automatic extension in bash. So if you use start.i, then the command will automatically be called with all the files that end with .i as command line arguments. Well, the way you do that is that you that you loop through all your through all your command line arguments and you call your you call your application with each. And so you have a for loop, 
for each argument in my command line arguments, call that pulse application and pass in the file that you want to have. Um, that you want to yeah, that you want to have as an input. And of course, now this for loop can be combined with all the strategies that we had before. Here's another idea, another common case. If you want to do some file management, let's say you want to you want to delete all the files, all the temporary files, um, and maybe you want to do some additional operation on them. So in this case, I get all my temp files and store them in a file slide directory. And then here I have a loop where I go through all the files that I want to delete. I do some operations on them. So I, here I just um, print out a message that I delete them, but there might be more complex stuff here. And then down here you, you delete to actually delete that file. Another thing that's quite useful is counters. So for instance, maybe you want to count the number of arguments that you have. The way you do that is quite simple. So you declare a integer, for instance, counter. You set it to zero. And then whenever you want to increment it, you call this arithmetic exp um, expression. You just counter plus plus, increments that counter, and then you get one higher. So for instance, if you want to have a program that goes through all the command line arguments and it tells you which number of the command line argument it is, this is how you would do it. You would have a, you have a counter, you set it at one initially, then you loop through all your command line arguments, print that command line argument, and then in increment your counter. Okay. Let's make use of what we've learned to create a bundle script. So the idea of the bundle script is that it takes in a bunch of files and it packs them together into one big file. And that big file should be self-extractable. So when you call that file again, so essentially what you do is you call bundle, then you provide a bunch of files and you, you you store the, um, the result into a new file, one file. And then you should be able to execute that file, and it should self-extract. It should extract itself. And so at the end, you should have these three fi files again. And this is how you would do it in Bash. Just five lines of code, or six lines. So what you do is, you loop through all your command, all the files that have been passed in as command line arguments. And now we need to, so the standard output of that script should be a script itself, right? So everything that we output here should be, should be a valid bash uh, commands. So what do we do? We first call echo unpacking um, this file. And then I use this cat syntax to, um, so I, I, I print out the cat symbol, uh, the, the cat command that will generate the file itself again. So essentially what I do here is, this is the file name, right? And then in here, here I actually print out the content of that file that will go into the, um, the standard output. I think this is best visualized if we look at an example. So let's say we have two files file one and file two. File one contains some text and file two contains some numbers. And now I want bundle file one, file two. So what, what you will get is this file here. It's, it's this content which you can store as a file. So essentially you get the echo unpacking file, file one, right? And then you get the cat command that generates um, file one, and uh, you can see the content here that it generates is exactly what we originally had in the first file. And then we have another echo command where the same thing is repeated for the second file. Okay, this is quite useful. This, I, I am going to stop after this. 
So imagine you have a script that consists of many, many tasks that are quite slow. For instance, you're trying to download many, many files from different web servers. So by default, so what you could do is you, you, can, you just list all these download commands, one after, after the other, or maybe in a for loop, right, in your script. And, um, uh, and, and, and then, I mean, that would definitely work. The problem of that is that it won't be executed in parallel, right? So essentially, you download one file, then you download the next file, then you download the third file. So eventually, this is going to be a very slow process. And the reason for that is because um, the commands are by default block blocking. So when you start a command in a bash script, it waits until it's finished, and then it continues with the next command. So what you can do, what you can do is you can run an application in the background. And the syntax for that is you have the... Um, CMD, you have the original command name, and then you just add an end at the end. And what that will do, it will just send the command in the background and will continue executing the script. You can also use the wait, the wait command in your script, and that essentially will um, start waiting until all the previous um, commands that you sent in the background are finished. So I want to show you a demo on how, how why this is useful. I mean, this is very simple, but it shows the principle. So imagine you have three commands that are really slow, sleep one, sleep two, and sleep three. And so every single time, so I first run sleep one, which sleeps for one second, and then I print out that this is finished, then I have sleep two, and it's finished, and sleep three is finished. And so if I don't have these equal signs here at the end, so for the sake of it, let's just remove it, and I remove this line here, okay? And so now if I run this, Okay, so the sleep one is finished, now I have two seconds, sleep two is finished, and after three seconds, sleep three seconds, and all the sleeps are finished. So this is, can be potentially quite slow. So what I do is I send them all in the background, and at the end, I add this wait statement here to stop the program until all of them are finished. And so now you could see they were all executed simultaneously, and the wait made sure that um, this all sleeps finished was executed after the other ones were finished before. Okay, I think I stop here. There's, um, there's some more useful things that in the slides that I couldn't cover today, but um, yeah, feel free to look over it yourself. Are there any questions? No, okay. See you next week.